Hello everyone um, who's coming in and joining us. Thank you so much for joining us and I'm thrilled I can see the numbers going up. It's great to see so many of you signing in. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the How To Academy uh, and though I'm sorry we can't all be in the same room just yet, uh, I'm so pleased we can still bring you and beam you these brilliant speakers um, at the click of a Zoom button and that we can mark the launches of it and discussions around their brilliant books. Um, not in any way least our guest this evening, who's quite extraordinary sensation of a book, which I'm just going to put in front of my screen, uh, Three Women, is of course the inspiration for our event this evening, or possibly this morning or this afternoon, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Um, and it launched in paperback last week. It's a book that we were just saying before we came on, truly begs discussion. So I have so many questions uh, and I'm sure you all watching will do too and I'm delighted we have this collective chance to ask them. Um, three women as I'm sure you will all be very well aware took the world quite by storm when it came out in June last year and um, it was certainly a publishing sensation it was a bestseller in the US and the UK named book of the year best book of the year by pretty much all the publicists that, that matter in all the places that matter and heaped with praise um, and Elizabeth Gilbert who's certainly a voice that we all should listen to called it a non-fiction literary masterpiece an extraordinary offering and it really is and I think Lisa's created a sort of gripping genre all of her own. Um, it's, it's the writing, if you, if you haven't read it, is it's poetic and, and lyrical and beautiful, but the content is, is very raw and very relatable and very real. As I say, I'm sure that you'll all be familiar with it, but if some of you listening have, it's managed to pass you by, um, I'm firstly incredibly envious that you've got a treat in store. But just to, just to recap, it, it tells the stories of three women um, and these are three painstakingly researched stories, as we will hear, of women who, um, who Lisa has spent thousands of hours with listening to over the course of eight years. She travelled all across America, immersing herself and thereby us as the reader as fully as possible in the authentic detail of their lives. Um, and just, just to run through, I think, just in case you don't know, so that the conversation makes sense. Um, there's Lena, who's in suburban Indiana, whose husband refuses to kiss her or to be intimate with her, and she's in the throes of an affair with a man she loves obsessively, who doesn't quite seem to return the sentiment. And there's Maggie in North Dakota, who's trying to get her life together after an affair with her high school teacher or an alleged affair with her high school teacher. Um, and lastly, Sloane from Rhode Island, whose husband um, enjoys watching her have sex with other people. But ultimately, it is a book about female desire. It's a book about female desire told entirely by women, which somehow still seems relatively shocking in today's society or relatively shockingly new in today's society. Um, and remarkably, it was your debut, I think. And when you're not writing best-selling sensations, um, Lisa is a journalist who's contributed to New York Magazine, Esquire, Elle, uh, and numerous other publications. And she was just saying as we came on air, I don't think she ever stops writing uh, and stops working. But that's enough from me. You've tuned in not to hear from me. You've tuned in to hear from Lisa. I'm going to do as little talking as possible. Um, we'll be in discussion for about the next 45 minutes. And then there'll be the chance for questions from you so please type them in the Q&A box um, and I will try and get through as many as possible um, so thank you all and Lisa again thanks very much indeed for joining us thank you for having me and the book came out a year ago as I say uh, or just over a year ago and as I mentioned and as everybody knows it's been a sort of extraordinary success rapturous response and the buzz really never calmed and it, last week I think you were nominated as narrative fiction book of the year um, at the British Book Awards did you ever expect a response of this scale um, have you got used to that idea yet no um, I thought I was writing a very quiet book so when this um when this happened, I was, I'm still shocked. And I am, I, yeah, I had no idea that it was going to happen. And um, I, I feel, I feel really grateful, obviously, for it. I feel mostly grateful that the women's stories have been heard and have felt, have made other people feel less alone. But yes, this is completely, it was just totally not expected at all. 
do you think um, that if you had known it would be so widely read and so, such a success in that way, you know, you would have done anything differently? Yeah, you know, I don't, I might not have spoken to um, someone like Sloan, for example, who did not want to, did not want herself to be, was happy and proud to tell her story and love to see it in print. But when the book started being read by so many people, I think it, it was difficult for her. So I don't know if I would have included her. Uh, I would have definitely done everything the same for the other two, specifically Maggie, whose life has been changed um, miraculously for the better since this has come out. Yeah, I mean, so you think perhaps Sloan wouldn't have, I was going to say, do you think the women would have opened up to you so liberally if they had known that their stories would be so widely read? I do think Lena and Maggie would have. I don't think that Sloan would have. Mm. And we'll come back on to Sloan and perhaps what the relationship with those women has been since in the past year since, since it came out. But I mean, you say I wasn't surprised by much during my research, but I was surprised at how strongly people related to it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you think it was that you tapped into out there. Well, when I, when I had moved to Indiana, which I did, I moved to Indiana from New York City rather suddenly without telling any of my friends because I didn't want anyone to try to stop me. Um, I, I was talking to Lena. I had started this discussion group in the back of a doctor's office. And I was talking to Lena about, um, about this new love that was in her life and the way that she was driving four hours to meet this man who only would give her about 30 minutes of his time and they would be having this very wild um, intimate encounters. And she was telling me everything and it was just so poignant and it was happening in the moment and everything about her story felt so real to me and so relatable. And so I started telling one of my friends who I said first, you know, I, I'm in Indiana. And she said, what are you doing in Indiana? Uh, and I think people had forgotten I was writing a book because I had didn't talk about it. I just kind of like drove around. Um, so I told my friend about Lena and she said, oh my God, that's so pathetic. And I had to remind her that she had done the same thing um, meeting someone for, you know, do, like just primping and doing all these things for hours just to get 20, 30, 45 minutes with somebody that, with whom she was obsessed. But because it was a vice president at Goldman Sachs and because, and, and you know, he wasn't a crane operator and because she was taking subways and Ubers and not, um, you know, not driving, not changing cars to save money on one lease because she was doing it in a different way, she was, she saw Lena's story as being other. And I wanted to make sure that, um, that anybody reading any of their stories would see themselves in, in some aspect and not in the aspect even of I'm driving X amount of hours to see this man, but in I want something so badly that I am putting a lot of things on the line for it, whether it's exterior or interior. And I definitely want to sort of explore a little bit further that idea about whether we were meant to, you know, you say your friend said she's pathetic and I'd love to come back to that in a moment because it's a really interesting one to ex you explore throughout the book about, you know, the power versus pity, essentially. Yeah. Can I just ask just um, to go back to the sort of writing of it? It's a book obviously written by a woman and very much about women, written by women, really, written by those three women. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes you directly copied their work mm -hmm. to the book, but... Would you say it's also for women or have you had men read it and, and do you want men to read it? Yeah, I mean, of the seven men who have read it, I'm hoping that they would. No, I, you know, I think that, um, yes, I, I want, I do want men to read it. One of the things that was so heartening for me was that one of the first men who read it said that prior to reading it, he didn't know how um, indifference could be so gutting. And I was really happy to, to hear that he felt that way because one of the things I wanted, one of the things Lena wanted was for the man that she was in love with to understand that just not responding to her text was excruciating. And it didn't have to be like, I love you. He could have just said, I can't see you for the next two weeks. And that would have been enough for her to just be able to, to, to have somebody say, hey, I see you there. I can't see you physically, but I, I, you know, I can't see you, but I, I, I am, I, 
you're, you have a space in the world and I will come back to you at some point, or I won't come back to you, but I will tell you that I am not going to. Just kind of the idea of, of somebody giving someone else this, just not, just the idea of not responding at all, the idea of, you know, what we call ghosting. Um, it's so, it's just so painful. And having heard that man, I don't think men often know that, how terrible it can be. I think that they compartmentalize so much and they pick things up when they want to and drop things off when they don't. And they don't do it out of any kind of nefarious um, activity or like just feelings. They just do it because they're like, oh, okay, today I'm playing tennis, you know, and then I'm going home and I'm eating Chinese food with my best friend. And then, you know, uh, this, oh, this woman texted me that I've been sleeping with and I will get back to her on Wednesday when I have all, you know, like I don't need to get back to her right now. And, um, and so the idea of that, that coming through to a man who didn't realize that that was something that hurt people, that was something that really made me feel like I had accomplished something. Yeah, that makes it sound like it's just as absolutely a sort of manual for, for men and also <laughs> yes. telling for women too. Um, and, you know, talking about when it came out and what you tapped into, and I'm sure that you've explored this in so many interviews, but it obviously came out sort of in the middle or, or around the Me Too movement. Um, and I, I feel like it has a very interesting and, and, and slightly complex relationship with that narrative because... Mm -hmm. You don't mention it overtly, and for all, for all the brilliant things, and we wouldn't deny it, that Me Too achieved, it, it felt to me reductive to try and frame my reading of it in that light. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to necessarily frame my reading of Three Women with the background of, of Me Too, and I feel like you're sort of trying to say, hang on, take a step back. It, it's much messier and much more complicated than that. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things I noticed, because I had reported um, and written 98% of the book prior to Me Too, um, was that the Me Too movement, like you said, which is vital and amazing, had brought with it a sort of inverse inverse um, effect that I don't think we would have wanted, which is that I think we were all in this sort of place and we continue to be, even though there's a lot of other things going on, um, to sort of raise women up and to tell men what we don't want from them, which is amazing. But I think that we have heard our sisters and friends, et cetera, even less, because the idea of we all have to be on this one side, we all have to be against X, Y, Z, then you have someone like Lena, for example, who's in the middle of America. She's not in a big city. She is not, you know, after the, the Harvey Weinstein case broke, I asked her what she thought about it and she hadn't heard about it. So, and the idea that we all think in larger cities and um, that we, you know, we have this news cycle, we, we consume a very certain type of news. And the type of news that Lena in Indiana consumes is incredibly different. So, but, but telling her story, one of the things I kept hearing was that she was a victim and how could she let herself be victimized by this man when in fact uh, she wasn't a victim in my eyes. I mean, she did things that probably were not good choices for her own feelings and her own heart, but she was going to see this man because she wanted to. He was often not even wanting to see her and she would sort of make it happen. So the idea that she's going after this person and this sex when she had not been touched for a decade by her husband, when you know she had been raped as a young woman, to finally be having sex that she wanted to have, uh, you know whether or not she's um, she's leaving her kids with a babysitter and trying to switch cars and doing all these things manically, she was doing it for herself. And so to call her a victim to me was was kind of the antithesis of what she was doing. And I also just think that as women calling each other victims or calling each other, you know, saying we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't like this person, we shouldn't want that, we should want this or that, I think it's victimizing to call each other victims. And I think that until we start getting past that, it, the Me Too movement could, you know, it would just be even more lifted. Do you think they saw themselves as victims and wanted the narrative to be like that? Or do you think they wanted the narrative to be them as having power and control? I mean, I think in terms of wanting, I think we always want to have power and control, but I also think that to sort of look at a person in a whole, in a whole sort of 
way, um, we are all the victims and the, um, the protagonists of our own stories at any given point in the year, the month, or even the day. And so uh, they, they were all things. I think people tend to, it, they, you tend to look at the sort of the negatives rather than Sloan being in a really happy marriage or, you know, you look at Lena, um, Lena driving these hours and having these really painful moments, but then there's also these moments where she's having sex that it's not even about having sex with this man. It's kind of about seeing herself in this, connecting with herself in this spiritual and bodily way. So, but to get that, to sort of have those moments of heightened passion, I think that what also comes with those high moments comes moments of deep pain. And the two kind of go hand in hand. And I think that, you know, these women probably would not have talked to me in the same manner if everything had been going fine in their lives. If it was all regular, there's nothing really to talk about. And you also have other things going on. You have a job, you have this, you don't have this one burning thing that you want to talk about. And so when you do have that thing, it has its highs and lows and they're remarkable. And let's talk about that process of, of how you got them to, to talk to you, because it is an extraordinarily you know, journalistic endeavor. I mentioned eight years, thousands of hours you spent, but right back at the start, um, you say in the, in, the, in the prologue to the book that uh, you, know, you, you were writing a book about human desire. You thought you'd be drawn to the stories of men. So how and why and where did that change? Well, I never stopped talking to men. Um, I, I was talking to one, uh, one young gay man who at 18 was a life coach, which I thought was really interesting um, thing. And I, I was always talking to men. I never stopped. I, I was talking, um, it was 90% women that towards the end that I was talking to. I would thought I would be drawn to men because I'm a woman. I thought that I would know, I would be more interested in an opposite, in the opposite gender. But what I started to find was that men, you know, they were, they were interesting, but they weren't, they weren't giving me the same sort of access that the women ended up giving me. And they weren't seeing things in the same, you know, like we were talking about before, men are compartmentalized and women, when they're having this wild passion, it's like kind of all, they think about, not because, it's not all they think about, they have other things they think about, but they're able to kind of, it all is like one giant ball of, of feeling, whereas men are kind of like, okay, job, life, sex, um, not life, job, sex, etc. cetera. Um, so I was just really, I was just really drawn to the women's stories. They were more complex. They were, and also there's the possibility that men, uh, didn't want to talk to a woman in a certain way about any kind of vulnerabilities that they wanted to kind of have this, um, this Lothario idea around them. And even my own brother who I spoke to at the very beginning for the book that I thought would just kind of be good practice. <laughs> he, even he with his own sister did not want to come off as being, you know, not, um, not just powerful and sexy to other, to women. And so I think that that was, that was, that was a part too of why women were more interesting to me, but it also could be possible that I didn't find the right men. So. Yeah. I mean, you obviously went to, to great lengths to find these women. And I think you actually found a lot more women and had to cut them down. So mm -hmm. how did it, how did you decide these three particular women? And find so, so the first draft, well, I spoke to hundreds, the first draft was about 20 and it gradually, and, and, then, and there were men in that group too, but I gradually got whittled down. So uh, some of, some of the reasons, one of them was one person I'd been talking to for six months dropped off. Uh, it was very difficult because I had moved to Los Angeles primarily for her. And uh, when, with the others, the ones who didn't want to sort of stop talking to me as that woman was, she didn't want to stop talking to me, but she wanted to stop talking for the book. Um, so the other ones who didn't mind and were in there had not really given me as much as those three women did. And what I mean by that is even just, had you looked at the first draft, it was like word count wise, it was, you know, uh, there were like six pages on on one of them and then 12 pages on another. And then the, the next, the, those three women were like 50, 100, you know, I had to cut hundreds of pages from each of their stories. So they had given me so much and other people didn't, other people wanted, you know, they would tell me a story and then they'd say, oh, I don't, can you not mention that I was, you know, wearing a red shirt? 
or whatever. I mean, obviously it was something more, um, more embarrassing or, or difficult for them to, to have said that they would want removed. And these three women didn't do that. Uh, as you can imagine, it's really hard to get people to talk about sex and to go really deep in that. And so the people that, that were gradually cut and whittled down just did not, did not get, give me that sort of access. And it, the access you have and the detail is, is sort of staggering. Um, and presumably that is because you sat with them, you talked to them, you observed them for hours and hours. I mean, it, there's a story I, I, you can tell us, I'm sure it's true, that you know, when you were telling Lena's story, you went to the places that she went to where she was having sex with, with, with have, um, where they were having their affair, and you went afterwards just to sort of absorb all of the, the sights and sounds. Yes. Um, you know, those were the things that were the most fun about it was uh, hearing from Lena this sort of thrust by thrust uh, recounting of what she had done, which was just obviously infinitely entertaining to hear because she was so in it and wanted to record it so much. And I was basically a recorder. So to hear these things coming out of her mouth, you know, sort of like just the very, very sticky details of it. Um, I guess pun intended, uh, was very, um, was just so exciting. And then to be able to go to the spot afterwards and see the same things that she had seen, it felt like a very, it just, it felt like a close, um, a close read of something and she wanted me to do it. So it didn't feel like, I just felt it, there was no sort of journalistic fear of having crossed any lines because she wanted me to see the thing. She would come with me and show me the places, the exact spot where they had made love. And so, yeah, for, yes, it was, there was a lot of being very close in that manner and it was really infinitely interesting to, to do. And, and you say at the beginning, I'm confident these stories convey vital truths about women in desire and they are, it's full of nuance and ambiguity. The stories are incredibly different um, and personal. But would you say, um, on the whole, looking back, that you learnt anything kind of universal about, about desire or what common themes you might have discovered, you know, perhaps that you didn't expect to go in there finding or, or that you learnt more about? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that the sort of representative aspect of it was sort of taken out of context. I guess the main thing that I meant was that these three women, um, had they have certain window dressings obviously maggie uh had a alleged relationship with a, her married teacher when she was underage in north dakota now you may not have had a relationship with your married teacher not you you know one um might not have had that but i would hope that by telling her story in a very granular specific way that the sort of the feelings of passion and the feelings of fear and pain and excitement would come through. And so for me, it was the idea that everyone and, you know, women, since I focused on them, uh, really just as everyone else does in the world, want to be loved for who they are, uh, seen for who they are, and, and not have to change who they are in order to be loved. And, and that was the common theme. And I don't, you know, I don't know if there's anyone alive who would say that that's not something that they want. Mm, it definitely is it yes uh, definitely sort of what comes through and we've I mean, there's so much we could go into about each woman and um i want to talk uh, a little bit quite a lot more about maggie who the story is extraordinarily compelling and there's so much about that one that you know you, you can look back at and wonder whether things have changed since can i ask before i move on to her just to talk about sloan a little bit further and we've, we've covered mm -hmm. lena and and her situation but Sloan is perhaps the one that closest fit to your initial idea of what you were writing about. Mm -hmm. You were going to be writing about swingers or, or that was what gave yeah. you a bit of, um, uh, you know, inspired you. So, so what, how did you find Sloan and what was it about her story that, that drew you to it? So I had moved to Newport where she was from, Newport, Rhode Island, um, and where she lived rather. And I had moved there for several other people who none of them, I hadn't known her when I had moved there. And one of them was the gay life coach. He was the one, one of the people in Newport that, that I had sort of contacted prior. And, um, and then I met some other people through him. And I thought that, that I would, I, I had a, enough people there that I was, I felt good about moving there. 
Um, but Sloan, so I talked to a friend, a friend, I talked to an acquaintance that I had made and I said, you know, I'm writing this book about desire, you know, sex. And the second I said, desire sex, she said, oh my gosh, I know who you should talk to. Uh, and she told me about Sloan and she said, you know, there's two things about her that I think are great for your book. And the first is that she has sex with other men in front of her husband. He wants to watch. And the second one, which was delivered with almost more sort of a front and like, can you believe this, that her husband wanted to have sex with her every day. And not only did she allow it, but she enjoyed it. And so the idea that this was, that this was a bad thing was so imminently interesting to me. And what, um, what also became interesting was the way that the community around her was judging her and the idea that they didn't want to know that she was having sex with her husband every day. Uh, so I started to think about how, how as much of the story about her and some of the other women was also a story about the way that they were treated by the people around them. I mean, judgment is an incredibly important theme for you, is, uh, you know, runs through the book. There's a, there's a quote um, that I thought spoke to me and I highlighted it. And then I listened to some interviews you've done and it turns out that every single female interviewer quotes back the same quote that they found extraordinary. But I, I'm just gonna read it. You're talking about judgment and, and you write it in the beginning. It's women in many of the stories that I've heard who have greater hold over other women than men have. We can make each other feel dowdy, whorish, unclean, unloved, not beautiful. In the end, it all comes down to fear. Men can frighten us, other women can frighten us. And sometimes we worry so much about what frightens us that we wait to have an orgasm until we are alone. We pretend to want things we don't want so no one can see us getting what we need. There's so much in there. And, and as I say, all, all your interviewers seem to have quoted it back. But this idea of judgment and how quickly women judge one another, it comes up and actually at the end, your mother, I, I think, you know, when she very sadly is, dies at the end of the book and tells you, don't let them see you happy, other women mostly. If they see you happy, they will try to destroy you. I'm just fascinated, was this something, this idea of judgment, was it there in your mind before you started reading or did it just become a prevalent theme organically? It was definitely there in my mind, but I wasn't, I mean, as a sort of human woman in the world, not as a writer, it was there in my mind. I saw it so much. I saw it, um, I saw it about me. I saw it, you know, I felt it often in myself about other people. What was really, um, what really became, when it really sort of locked in for me was when I, I was in that discussion group with Lena before I even told my friends, um, my fr the friend who said she was pathetic. And after the, the room was, after the sort of discussion was over, several of the women would come up to me or I would interview them privately afterwards, much the way I did with Lena. And they would say, oh my God, she's such a slut. You know, things like that. And can you believe what a slut she is? Like to me, because they felt like, you know, and I was so shocked by that and uh, so, yeah, the theme of, of women, and the thing was they didn't, they didn't want to see her. They were so um, caring about her when she came in and said her husband didn't touch her. He wouldn't kiss her. All she wanted was a kiss. But then the second she came in and said, oh my God, I've, you know, I'm having this amazing sex with this man that I've been obsessed with since I was a young woman. They just instantly like backed off and didn't want to hear it anymore. And, you know, I think there's a, a famous line that says if you're you know it might be actually famous it might be from Seinfeld where um I think one of the characters says uh nobody wants to hear it if you're in a happy relationship you know just talk to me when you hate the person you're with and that's so true um in what I've found and when it came to Lena and to uh to have her telling everybody this amazing all this amazing sex stories they just they just didn't want to know about them. And they, in fact, just wanted to pick out a reason for why she was not, was not someone that, that, that they should hang out with. And you've, I feel like you very consciously wanted to sort of differentiate yourself from this judging person. I mean, Lena says women shouldn't judge one another's lives if we haven't been through one another's fires. And I feel like you want to come across as the sort of one who's holding together all these stories an entirely non-judgmental way to let the reader make their opinion. 
Yeah. Well, what's funny is a couple of people said, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you come up with like, why didn't you sort of, what's your take, not what's your take, which is my take is that we all want to be loved, but like, why didn't you sort of have a, an end note for each of them, like what you thought. And it was so weird to me that people would have one wanted that because I think that people should make their own takeaways. Um, but more importantly, like who I'm not an expert on anything. The only thing I was an expert in was listening. And so for people to sort of want someone else to make a tidy judgment about something, I've always thought was a strange thing to want. And I certainly wasn't going to do it myself. And I also, I didn't judge them. And I got to a place with, with the book that I think really, I saw what judgment did. And I saw that it came from often our own shame. You know, when we judge people, it's self-shame. You know, we, we remember something that we've done that made us feel bad about ourselves. And now we see it in somebody else and kind of want to stamp it out. Or we're jealous and we see, you know, Sloan having sex with her husband every day and it's easier to call her, it's either, it's easier to call a woman a slut than it is to call her sensual. And I would, I would say, and you could tell me I'm wrong, that to me there was one place where I felt your, your opinion um, and it would be Maggie's. Maggie, yeah. um, right. You know, you say at the end um, that, 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 you, you know, he's teacher of the year and, and she's sort of picking up the pieces of her life. And you kind of obviously are almost the first person to tell her side of the story. Uh, and you, you say sort of women have agency, but children do not. And mm -hmm. he essentially, you know, could have given her this amazing life as a, as a brilliant teacher. And he really didn't. Do you feel that, you know, you were kind of compelled to get her story heard where yes. no one else was? Yes, from with Maggie, it was it was definitely more so. Um, it was for her more so than it was for the idea of people reading it and feeling something. Which is w with Lena, since I knew Lena's story, Lena's telling her story out loud to the world was not going to help her after seeing what happened in the world with Lena. It was more about me hearing it and being there, like a human just being on the other end of that. Um, but with Maggie, I was very much, it was something I really went after because I had been in this cafe in North Dakota reading the local paper and I read this story about Maggie and her trial had just ended. She had brought charges against her teacher. And what I, I was struck that, um, that there were, the, they could not recover the text messages, which she alleged were very, you know, steamy. Um, but they could recover the phone calls and there were hundreds of phone calls, most of many of them after midnight. And I was just so, um, I was so shocked that people in a jury and, and not even in the jury, but in the town, her friends and family and people just who lived amongst her would not believe her. Like, what is a teacher doing talking to a student after midnight? the calls were, you know, he said that he was helping her and all of the, it was just so, I mean, I get so angry thinking about it, but it was so shocking. And um, what I said to Maggie was that I, I really strongly believe that people out in the wide world are going to believe you the way that people in your town didn't. And I also said, you know, I want to tell your whole story. I think that's the thing that's important is like, nobody has taken your story completely you need to tell like literally i said even the stuff that you know would not be something that you would think you should tell like the things where you had done things that people could then look at and say oh well she's done this before and i said you know i want to tell those things too because they're true and i need to put them in there and also because if it's just this like kind of like angel devil thing which is really not what life is black and white even though yes she was a victim and he was the perpetrator in my mind and in many people's minds um so for me it was yes for me with maggie it was very much a sort of personal like you know wanting to tell her story more so than it was telling a book and she obviously is the one character that made the decision to keep her name I mean it's all in the court records and he yes. was acquitted do you think she saw this as a sort of cathartic experience a release for her more than the others yes I mean I don't to be honest I don't I think in the middle of it sometimes it would be I think it was cathartic to tell her story, but I think it's been infinitely more cathartic after the book has come out, which was my greatest hope uh, 
the, really my greatest hope period was that people would hear her story and be, um, and, and believe her really, that's it. But, uh, so much has happened that has made me feel so good because it's made Maggie feel good. She is a social worker. Now she's helping young women like herself. Um, she has heard from so many hundreds of women, as I have too, asking me to pass along messages to Maggie that just, you know, she is, that she has helped them tell their own stories, that she has made them feel unalone. There was, uh, and then there, her, her, um, her hero growing up was Abby Wambach, because she, Maggie, you know, was a wonderful soccer player and wanted to continue. And after all this, stuff happened with the teacher she kind of let that and a lot of other things fall by the wayside but abby wombach posted a picture of herself reading three women and i wrote to her uh, it was on instagram i wrote to her and i said you're maggie's hero and she wrote publicly maggie's my hero and so that for maggie like i get really um thinking about remembering that that is what i wanted for her and it wasn't that the book did that. Um, I mean, the book gave her a voice, but she did that for herself by being brave enough to tell that story. It actually wider than that, the book gave her a voice, but I don't know if you set out to do this, but you know, one wonders a year later, there are, there have been big shifts in, in narratives over the past year. And there are other scenarios in which um, works of art have, have, you know, brought cases back into the into the forefront. Do you think or have any hope that your narrative might bring this case back to the courts? I mean, her story is very compelling as you tell it. And as you say, conversations late, late, late into the night, it seems extraordinary that these sorts of things um, were, were you know, was, was seen as, as not evidence of them having an affair. Yes. I mean, I do. I hope. Yes, I do. But at the same time, I don't know if that's something Maggie necessarily wants to go through again. And so I think for her, it's more important about, you know, to sort of heal herself than it might be to, to have someone pay. Um, I, I would hope that having heard her story, I, I know that in Fargo, where she and, and the teacher both continue to live, that the book was bought the first day it was sold out across all of the bookstores. So at the very least, I would hope that, um, that there's a sort of comeuppance in that regard. Uh, so yes, but I mean, I, yeah, it, it, I would hope whatever Maggie would want in terms of court stuff. And did you, I, I want to talk about a little look at your relationship with the women that's gone on over the year, but what about their the other people in the story, so um, Aaron or, or Aidan, I mean, have any of them got in touch with you and been less than warm um, mm -hmm. at stories that, you know, because it's intimate about their lives and mm -hmm. without their approval? Yeah, well, the men who were in Lena's story and Sloan's are not named, so um, they, I, I do believe, like I know that Lena's husband um, knew that she was talking to me. Sloan's husband knew she was talking to me. I don't think Aiden did. Um, I did try to, I did, I talked to Lena's husband. I talked to several of the people in their orbits. Ultimately, I decided that I didn't want anybody else's voice instead of theirs. You know, that, that you can tell a story from a he said, she said, you can tell a sort of 360 degree view story, but I really wanted it to just be them. And then, you know, whatever, whatever, the way that they experienced their lives, not the way that it was. And I think that the way experienced it is their experiences were true and facts, but there are many sort of versions of how you can look at something. And I wanted to see theirs and only hear theirs. Uh, when it came to Aaron, I tried to contact him multiple times over email and phone. Just, and just, just to um, tell any, any, you know, anyone who's sort of lost that Aaron is the teacher who, who yeah, who is a- Oh, sorry, yes. Um, I tried to contact him multiple times, email, phone. Um, in the end, I sent numerous tech faxes to his lawyer uh, I didn't hear back at all. I have not heard back, heard anything at all. And it's quite surprising to me, but I mean, also kind of good because I don't really want to field that phone call. Uh, and, I think, uh, you know, I've heard you say, in fact, that, that this is a question British people and British journalists sort of can't quite grasp uh, in a way that American 
you know, your American audience just let it go. But it wasn't a very messy legal process trying to get that. Yeah, it's funny. Um, yeah, I've heard that from most British people and not in the US. It's an interesting thing. I would have thought so too. The book was extensively legally vetted by lawyers of, of all, like from Simon & Schuster, the publisher from multiple different places. It was um, fact-checked by a professional fact-checker. I went over the course documents. We also made it clear in the, in the text that it was Maggie's story, um, not you know that a jury saw it differently. And, but this was her story. And so it, in her story, this is, you know, his name was public, um, public record. So it, it was, uh, yeah, I, I guess my answer is it, it, we checked all of the boxes and we did everything that we had to do. I tried to contact him. I would have with him, since I was using his name, I would have used his words. I would have included them. So he didn't, he didn't, he chose not to, and that was his choice. And you say you, you and Maggie are, are, are in contact. I mean, I think you said every day. And is that yeah. the situation? Are you in contact now with all of the women? I mean, it's been a year since the publication. And obviously, as I said, the, the success, you know, hasn't died away. Their stories are in the limelight. Do they feel all right? And, and, and do, do you talk to them about that and, and stay in touch? Yes, um, with with Lena uh, once every couple of weeks, and with Sloan a little bit less. She's Sloan is more so in her own life and has always been. Uh, whereas Lena, um, Lena has always wanted to keep talking to me about things. So it's yes. I mean, I keep in touch with all three of them. I think I would be a sociopath if I didn't care and want to. I also just on a sort of selfish level, specifically with Lena. Um, I am so, I, I remain so curious about what is going on in her life that she's with a new man now. Um, there's like just her, her sex life and the way she views it and the way that she feels she's owed what she wants from the universe and to feel sexy and to feel loved is so powerful that no matter what's going on in her life, it's, it, she's, it comes across with this sort of, this, this complete, um, immediate passion and so yeah I could I could have gone on reporting Lena's story forever. Um, what, what is next for you I mean would you go back would you revisit it would there be the sort of the sequel from these women or would um, you, or, or for example I know you spoke to a great many others whose stories weren't included and I wonder if they're you know at you to, to tell their stories. Well I've you know I will probably I have a novel coming out next summer so I, I've definitely used some of the stories in a, in a fictional sense in just the same way you would use any experience that you've had in your life to inform any kind of writing. Um, but I, also this book is being uh, made into a limited series for Showtime. So I, you know, there'll be more people from who didn't make the book, uh, but, you know, again, fictionalized versions that it will have, there'll be a lot of sort of, you know, taking um, poetic license with things because it's a whole different animal. It's not, you know, it'll be based on a true story, et cetera. But um, so, yeah. You say you're writing a novel and you know, my last question, I, there's lots I'm sure coming in and people will be so many curious to ask you their own, but it, the book, as I said, it is incredibly sort of poetic. You've, you've written it very compelling, like a novel, you know, you start with Baudelaire quotes and, um, it sort of feels in a way at odds with a very raw, very real content. I'm wondering if that was a conscious decision and whether you thought maybe more people would stay on board like that. Yeah, I wanted it to not be boring. Uh, I wanted it to be as interior as possible. I wanted to, you know, and to do that with nonfiction is obviously you need to do a lot more work than with fiction. So what I would do is I would just ask the same questions multiple times, um, you know, ask just specific questions. If, if Maggie told me about the t-shirt she was wearing, I would say, you know, did it have a collar? Did it have buttons? I mean, that's a sort of, um, you know, a general way of saying that that's, and, and it mostly was with sex. Like when it came to Lena and her sex, I would be very, I'd ask very specific questions and she wasn't uncomfortable. And in fact was completely 
excited to answer them. So, uh, you know, and I also texted with them, emailed with them. So to have their kind of voices, their exact words, that, like you said, I printed, um, I printed some things verbatim that they had told me or they had written to me. I wanted it to be as sort of near as possible. In order to do that, it just was a matter of spending hundreds of hours and just listening and talking. And it does, it reads, I mean, it's, it's a complete sort of, it doesn't, you forget the, the nonfiction element of it in a sense, you kind of, it's a page turner. I kept calling it a novel and my friend was correcting me, you know, to re <laughs> remind me. Um, I, I'm going to just uh, bring up the, the Q&A because you know, hundreds more questions myself, I, off, I can't be selfish. Um, and there are some lovely questions coming in. So I certainly want to, um, I want to ask them J just to pick up that um, on, on the Maggie story. Um, Someone says, you know, do you think that Aaron can actually survive the publication of this book? It was what I really, what we spoke about before. Have you had any inclinations further that he, that he can't, you know, that he will be visited by perhaps the authorities? I, I think he can very well survive. I think that men have been surviving for hundreds of, you know, centuries, for centuries, not hundreds of centuries. Um, but men have been doing just fine. So I think that Maggie, um, Maggie's survival in this was, it was infinitely more necessary and interesting. And I think that, um, you know, I think that her story being out there is so weird and strange for some people. It makes them uncomfortable because it is a woman's story and we are meant to sort of look at this man as he having done something wrong. And what was so interesting to me is, you know, Maggie's mother said to me and several other people said, it's much easier to look at, uh, to look at this sort of woman as a kind of um, femme fatale trying to tempt the man who's married than it is to look at a man who we see as this kind of, you know, we hold him up as this, um, this, sort of pillar of the community to look at that person as a bad person is a lot harder to swallow yeah i mean that's the narrative you you've seen repeat again and again i think that um maggie's mother just says you know of course the world sides yeah. with a nice looking man and and as he goes on to become i mean now he's you know goes on to become teacher of the year and i mean that's ultimately i feel what gets her you know what makes drives her to to make her decision to actually sort of take the report but you know, I suppose you feel sad reading that. You hope that that narrative might have changed, um, but it, but it, but it clearly, it clearly hasn't. This wasn't yeah. that long ago. Um, and another person says, uh, the fact that we even need to be talking about this subject, do you feel that we have regressed rather than progressed as a society, and when will we no longer need these conversations? I don't, you know, I don't think we've regressed. I think that, that we have periods, like every decade it changes. We have a regression, we have a sort of movement. And then I think that what happens is the collective movements over the years change the conversation. But I don't think that we have regressed. I think that, as I said before, you know, we talk, the women in this in this book are not victims, but they talk about things that make other people see them as victims. And Lena being in, rural Indiana does not, it, it just because it doesn't compute with someone else's experience of sex and love, uh, it doesn't mean that, that she is a regressed person. There are, we regress, we are regressed in so many ways that we refuse to kind of, um, to refuse to look at and refuse to admit, but it's easy to look at Lena because she has been so honest talking about this man and the way that she went to go, she, the way she would drop anything to see him. We do that, many of us do that. I've spoken to hundreds of people who do that in different ways. And it's just easier to point a finger and say, you are, you are, you are, in, the, you are in the sort of dregs and um, we've all moved on. And the other thing about that that's difficult is that we often look at women like that as sort of ghosts from our past and we don't want to hear it anymore. And it's like, why are we talking about them? And it's like, we're talking about them because they're alive and because we're still doing, we're still talking about them in this negative way. So we should be talking about them in a way that is, um, you know, that, that is, that is nurturing and not the opposite. And again, you know, we touched on this, but it's, it's hard for anyone to put down the pen <laughs> I think when they're writing a book and the narrative carries on, but um, someone asks, 
how did you know when to stop writing about these women's stories because their stories and their lives continue? I mean, it must be very frustrating in a way. Yeah, it's fine. It was really hard. And, you know, it got to like year nine and I felt like I should stop. Um, no, it was difficult. It was, there were, there were moments at which it's such a good question because it really, I kept one of my editors, not, not for this book said to me, you got to just wrap it up. And that was like year five. And, you know, I, I wasn't, it, it didn't feel done yet. I did not have, I didn't have Sloan by until I, like year six. Um, so I, 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 it, I knew that it didn't feel ready. And I also, by the time I'd found those three women, there were things coming out towards the ends that they were telling me. And, you know, there were a couple of, um, of, of, of revelations that they had so that when I had these revelations, not when I had them, when I heard them having them, it sort of clinched it up for me. So, so it was, it, after a while, it was kind of, things came out and it was organic and helpful, but yes, it was still a decision to stop. And, um, another, uh, another person sort of says, um, that wonders whether you learned anything about your own life or, or whether it essentially affected your own life. And it, it must've done, of course, beyond, listening to their stories and being almost a therapist for all, all that time in so many ways, but did um, learning about their lives and their sex lives affect your own life? Um, yeah. I mean, it affected my life in the sense that for nearly a decade, I, yeah, I didn't, um, I was talking to people every day and listening to them and not, and not really focusing on my own life. Um, obviously I had, I had, I was having a life. I had had a child and the, you know, gotten married and had a child, towards the middle and end of the, of the life of, of the research. So it, it definitely affected, um, it affected me, uh, but at the same time, I felt very com I felt infinitely more comfortable listening to people than I did, than I do talking about myself. And so in a sense, I, I really miss that aspect of, of those quiet 10 years, even though there was so much going on, mm -hmm. it was me in the background. And you took your baby to all the meet with you all the time. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, towards the end when she was, you know, around. And of course, when I was doing, um, you know, I, when I was doing a lot of, like, she didn't come with me to every interview and, and hang out, but whatever place I moved to, obviously she came to me. Um, she came with me. And yeah, I mean, there would be days in the sort of early days of her. Um, when I was in North Dakota, she was with me and I had her like, on a sling at my chest and I would go into bars and ask people for, um, for whether they wanted to talk about their sex lives with me. And it was, I found it much easier to have her as a prop because going into bars by myself and asking those questions was a lot creepier. <laughs> and you borrow a bit, like to, to <laughs> borrow a baby. And yeah, exactly. It's a great. Endeavor. Um, yes. Talking about journalistic endeavors, somebody says, um, how, you, how did you find that leap from um, you know, being a journalist to writing a book? And, and it, you know, actually, I suppose it wasn't a great leap. This is a journalistic, this is a great big journalistic endeavor as, of a book. But how did you find that leap? Well, I didn't really, I mean, I had always, um, I had always been writing um, I, I mean, I wrote a novel, the one that'll be published next summer. I wrote that towards, at the same time that I was finishing up Three Women because I've always helped that, I've always found that it helps for me to do, to do both fiction and nonfiction at once and to just not even that, to just be working on more than one project at once because if you feel stuck on one, you don't feel like it's the end of the world because you have something else going on, whether it's in your brain or something that's actually due to somebody. So it didn't, it wasn't a leap. I, and I'd also been writing stories for Esquire and writing short stories for Esquire. So I was always doing both. Um, I didn't, I was always writing. Yeah, I was always long form writing. So it, it wasn't a leap in that sense. Um, I mean, someone says, we touched on it, but someone says, how did you come up with the idea for the book? And I think perhaps it'd be interesting for you to, um, tell us about the inspiration who was in the book that was the book that initially inspired you. You then went, went on to write, write a very different book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually I'd love to hear the story, which I've heard you recount of, of your meeting with that. Yes. Woman. 
Yes. Um, so I had, when I was sort of getting ready to figure out um, what kind of a book I was going to write, I read Gay to Lisa's Thy Neighbor's Wife, which I had read as a younger woman, but which I, um, I didn't, um, I, I came back to when I was, so anyway, I had read it as a young woman, as somebody who wanted to be a writer, and I found it really just amazing. And, you know, the Gay to Lisa, the author had spent a decade um, going, you know, living in it. Well, he did a lot of things. So one of the main things he did was live in this swingers mansion uh, and he would have sex with people. He also operated a massage parlor and this was while he was married and operating the massage parlor. He would also, you know, have to sample the wares to make sure that he knew what the experience was like for the book and, and just for himself. And so I went to go meet him as a sort of, I thought he could be a mentor and I was really excited and he's this 80 year old man. And I just thought that I was going to get this very helpful um, uh, instruction. And the instruction I got was that the only way that I would be able to, uh, I would never supersede his book in any way. I would not bring any new light to anything. But the only way that I might bring something new to the table was if I went out and slept with married men and recorded those those experiences. And it was just funny thing because it was so the prescription for that was very it was like, this is it. It wasn't like this plus, you know, these other 18 things. It was this will get you what you need. Um, and I was very upset. I went home and I, I called someone I called a fellow writer and editor and I said, you know, he told me to do this. This is the person that I've, I'm like, what, what does it make it find me a bad journalist that I'm not going to do it? Just am I choosing morals over, um, you know, over journalistic integrity? And I, I quickly decided that I wasn't and that it was, uh, you know, just, it wasn't me, it was him. Um, and yeah, so I just decided I wanted to I didn't, and the other thing that he did, and you know, one time I brought an escort, a high, high, um, expensive escort who was making a couple of thousand a night. Uh, I brought him to this dinner with her and he sort of was trying to show me how to interview. So he'd be asking her all these like rapid fire questions. And it was very like, he's like, well, how much do you charge for just a hand job? And it was very like, it was, and she became to, she started to get uncomfortable, even though she was familiar with the parlance of, of sex and sex acts, but the way he was talking to her was so aggressive. And I, I had been sort of, I'd done political stories. I'd done all sorts of stories where being aggressive is something that you need to sort of do. But with, I was, I was going to be talking to people who were not in the public eye with, I guess, the exception of Maggie, but she wasn't like a celebrity or someone that wanted to be in the public eye. Um, so I wasn't going to ask questions like that. I was going to listen and be kind. And, you know, cause I didn't want to be aggressive. And I just, I also don't think I would have gotten anything if I were aggressive. Cause what is the point? Um, so yes, that was the inspiration. <laughs> I think a, that that should have gone in your prologue and B, it should have <laughs> gone in there as exactly, he, he essentially told you entirely what not to do. And oh. thank God you did the antithesis and gave us the book that you did because you clearly you. lost <laughs> a deep, a deep um, you know, relationship with these women that enabled us to just live their lives. Um, and I wish we could carry on talking about it. And sadly the hour is over, but um, the, just to tell people that the, uh, recording of this will be sent I think in about 24 hours so if you have friends or family that missed it and you want them to hear uh, Lisa's wisdom you can send it their way and also um, a, a link to where you can buy the paperback of the book um, from a nice independent bookshop but thank you all very very much for tuning in and Lisa thank you so much for, for joining. Thank you us. Hannah. Yeah. Thank you How To Academy and Hannah it's been absolutely a pleasure I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.